welcome to Cannon Fodder, a behind-the-scenes look at the Glass Cannon Network. Yo, what is going on, everybody? Welcome back to Cannon Fodder. It is Wednesday, July 24th, 2024, and I'm your old pal, Joey O'Brien. And I'm Troy Vanilla Thunder Lavalley. Vanilla Thunder. Is that the name of the coffee that you're drinking right now? No, that would be delicious, though, if it had a little vanilla. It's just Black Duncan's. <laughs> just Black Dunkin'. That was my yeah. other nickname. Oh, truly Vanilla, Black Thunder. Vanilla Thunder sounded like a really good coffee. It why. does sound fun. Or maybe like an energy drink. Yeah. Yeah, like, yeah, oh, have I you like tried that. Vanilla Thunder? That's their new one. <laughs> 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 Gotta get yourself some Vanilla Thunder. Uh, we are back with the FOD. Very excited to hang with you guys today and talk about what's going on around here, around these parts. Troy and I just wrapped up like an hour-long business meeting. A lot of exciting irons in the fire. <laughs> Dude, that was uh, 90 minutes. Was that 90? Yeah. That flew by. That flew was fun. by. Uh, it's always exciting talking about the future and fun stuff happening. Uh, we'll cover some of that today as we talk about the next couple weeks, which are going to be jam-packed for everybody here at the Glass Cannon Network and for a lot of you as well as uh, we come up on San Diego Comic-Con and Gen Con. Of course, we'll talk about the Glass Cannon podcast for a little bit. Uh, a brief We Are Stupid with a, uh, with a visual aid. Spoilers. And uh, finally, some listener mail, as as always. Uh, notes from the niche. Uh, we'd love to speak back to you guys. So, uh, yeah, that, we're going to start it off really just talking about Comic-Con. It's Comic-Con week. Uh, it's it's a big week, something that was never on our radar before. Nope. Years ago, we would never go. And now a uh, couple years in a row here. We're, we're leaving uh, tomorrow. We fly to San Diego. So uh, how are you feeling? You, you excited? Fast. You prepped? You ready? Uh, but what is it? This comes out on Wednesday. Yes, I'm prepped. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Uh, yeah, you know, last year at this time, I was so strung out as we always are uh, leading up to Gen Con. But I remember last year, I had my uh, my little board with all the shit that I had to do, and it was just I, I couldn't see the forest through the trees. And I remember hitting Sunday at four and just like collapsing. Uh, and I did it. And this year, I'm like, I'm not doing that again. I don't. I want to be much more prepared. And just with little changes that I've been making throughout the year, uh, it's it kind of happened naturally. And so I'm. I feel good. I'm not stressed. I'm excited. I think that it would be great if this wasn't the week before Gen Con that we were going that to San Diego. Uh, yeah. Just for my family that I'm leaving two weeks in a row. <laughs> uh, but uh, it'll be fun, man. It's going to be a whirlwind. And it's going to be fun to do some other things too, because I'm we're obviously we're doing the Marvel Multiverse 7:30 p.m. Uh, or 7:30 p.m. Pacific uh, on Friday, but then I'm doing a panel Saturday morning on just sort of like uh, actual play in general. Uh, hopefully, you know, maybe catch some new fans from that, and then I'm going to be on Faster Purple Worm uh, with a character that I came up with that I'm really really excited about. Oh, cool. I've never seen it done before. I'm sure it has been done, but I was like, what the hell am I going to do for a character? I was like, oh. I've got a fun Well, can concept. you tell us about it? I mean, can you tease it? It's not like anybody's ever going to see this, right? Is it being yeah. filmed? No, it's not being filmed. I, my idea was I wanted it to be this sort of like yuppie prep school boy whose parents didn't think he like amounted to anything. And so he's like, I'll show them. And he goes off and like tries to live lean without his parents' influence. So he's a barbarian. <laughs> so he's a barbarian that's like a really like an overprivileged kid. But he's like, I'm a barbarian now. I don't know how he's going to, what his voice is going to be. But I'm like, I love this idea because I really wanted to play a barbarian. But it's like, I don't want to be like. Uh, uh. Yeah, the classic this. barbarian. Yeah. yeah, so he's like a barbarian. He's just he's just <laughs> roughing quotes. it. He's a first level barbarian, so he's like literally just roughing, and he's going to die by the end. Of it. He's slumming it. That's great. Yeah, he's going to go off to prove himself, and we all know he's going to die, <laughs> which yeah. is very funny. <laughs> very funny way to go into uh, fast. I'll football. show them. Yeah. So anyway, exciting stuff coming for San Diego Comic Con. I hope that you're there and, and can join us. If if this is the first you're hearing about it, uh, and you can be there. Just get there and then come hang out and see the show. We're playing Marvel multiverse role playing game. So very much so looking forward to that. As far as content that's coming out this week on the Glass Cannon, already uh, released a, a, a character creation sample from the new Welcome to Night Vale RPG, which I know people are very excited about. Welcome to Night Vale is going to uh, it's going it's coming to backer kit as an RPG to develop an RPG in the fall. And uh, we get a little sample taste of the game. So we got some character creation uh, with Jared and Matthew and then going into uh, a full one shot session that'll air during Gen Con. So that's that's really exciting. Uh, so that that's already on our YouTube. If you want to check out the character creation sample of what it looks like to build a character in the weird in the weird world of Night Vale and then 
Pendragon. Pendragon continues. If you didn't catch it, last Friday night we did character creation. This Friday night, 8 o'clock Eastern, we're going to premiere part one of this story. I've already recorded it. Uh, It's awesome. So I really can't wait for you guys to see it slash listen to it. And where can they listen to it on the... Uh, the there's a Gen Con feed now, right? Uh, yeah, Gen Con recordings. Gen Con feed. Yeah, it used to be Gen Con pop up recording studio on our premium uh, subscription service. Now it's been rebranded to just Gen Con recordings, where these are uh, pre recorded. But man, that thing is going to be. It's already chock full of content, but by the end of Gen Con, it's going to be loaded with another. Uh, let's see, eight times three twenty four plus for like another thirty hours of content. Um, but yeah, man, in like, I'm in having like one weekend, you're going to get like thirty hours this of content on this one podcast feed, and so much stuff. I mean recorded like probably 80 percent of it at this point and and man there are some hits there are some hits i'm having like pendragon fomo but uh i uh i'm excited to see what you guys do with it yeah i'm i'm really excited to see for everybody to, to uh get a chance to watch and listen to it it's just so much freaking fun i had this idea and i was like pardon me i don't know when we could put this together or how we could put it together but the way that pendragon lines up it's character creation and the way the game plays. You remember this vaguely from last year's Gen Con, where the the primary traits that you have are all sort of like two ends of a spectrum. Yeah. So it, it always totals up to 20, your scores, uh, for every uh, one of these like polarizing features. And it'll be like, are you... Um, 20? I thought it was 100. No, it adds up to 20 okay. uh, because it's a D20 system, but like Cthulhu, okay. it's a roll under system. Yeah. So if your score is 11, that means you need to roll 11 or less on a D20 in right, order right. to okay. succeed. And uh, so, yes, you remember these traits. There's like generous to selfish. You know, there's like uh, temperate to indulgent. There's uh, uh, God, there's spiritual to... I can't remember what the other side was, uh, earthly or something. I can't remember. worldly, something like that. Anyway, they're valiant to cowardly, right? So there's all these these um, these you know lines of spectrum basically of where your character stands. And I was like, it would be really funny if we made these for ourselves, <laughs> like for our actual <laughs> personalities. You know, like where it is what what trait is Matthew most famous for? You know, like among <laughs> these traits, because being famous for means you have a 16 or higher in that trait. So anyway, it just cracked me up because it's like it makes it so fun to role play, like to be outside of combat, which you are most of the time. It makes it so fun to role play because you're rolling dice to see how you act in a situation. And uh, it, and you don't always have to roll. You can just do whatever you want. But then, like, you can tick your box in certain areas and, and move things as you develop your character. Anyway, it's a blast. Well, yeah, I don't know if we talked about this on stream, but I didn't realize you guys are playing the, the beginning of the Grey Knight scenario. And this was like an old scenario that's been updated. And it was written by Larry Dottillo, who did Massive Nearlithotep. And I was like, oh, man, if I'd known that, I would have done Pendragon. That sounds so cool. Because yeah. I didn't realize that there's this like other element when 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 uh brian ran it for us obviously he had merlin but the magic part of it was like it was obscure i thought it was pretty much you know sword and board with like an element of sorcery that could be explained away but it sounds like with the gray knight no there's there's like real magic in this world and like i was like oh shit i i completely i, I thought of pendragon in a whole new way when i when i started reading about this uh gray knight scenario yeah i did not see it coming it's really awesome and also brian is, is brian holland from chaosium is very clear about pendragon being a very it, it, you play it the way your table wants to play it you can make it as mystical or as grim dark or gritty as you want you can have elements of magic you can have no magic it's really up to you how you want to approach your I game love that. he likes a little bit of a grittier style game but it does definitely have mystical elements to it and so it's very interesting to play these like hard scrabble knights in this medieval setting that you start out believing is you know just kind of uh, quote unquote historically accurate which by the way we have a good laugh about but is <laughs> but then when magic enters into it you're like holy crap how would these people react to the idea of mystical things happening uh, it, it's made it I, I cannot wait for you guys to see where this story goes it's just so awesome and to me I'm like I just want to get more Pendragon in my life Yeah. Uh, so that is going to be airing this week part one of the actual story airs Friday night so check that out and you'll be all caught up for when the, the uh, end of that story or whatever it is part two I don't know if it's going to be the end or start of something more would air during Gen Con uh, on Friday morning at 10am so anyway looking forward to that so, yeah, I mean, that's it for news as far as what's coming in the next week. We got another big kind of can of fodder next week as it's going to be Gen Con week. So we'll be on, you know, we'll be talking all about Gen Con then and uh, and we'll get to that 
at that point. So yeah. um, a, a, how are the shows doing uh, in terms of Call of Cthulhu Live, at least, Athenaeum? Uh, is that sold out? So, are yeah, there still well, tickets left? There's 20, as of the time of this recording, which is, we're recording this on Monday, there's 21 tickets left. That means we've sold like 340, which would make it one of our largest shows of all time. Um, come on, 21 tickets at 20 bucks a piece. I'll just buy them. Yeah, come uh, out and see Call of Cthulhu come on, see that. live. Glass Cannon live at Helium's been sold out forever. Uh, they want us to add a second show. I was like, we got enough going on. But uh, I'd say between Blades in the Dark live uh, get in the trunk live, which is sold out. Uh, Starfinder 2E live and uh, the 1920s Call of Cthulhu live. We've sold on average about 300 plus tickets to each of those shows. Now, Blades in the Dark and Starfinder, those are 400 seat uh, auditoriums, which means there's about 90 tickets left. The Call of Cthulhu one is a 700 seat auditorium. So there's like 400 something tickets left. All those shows are going to be jammed, but please, all the tickets are $14. If you're coming out, Bring a friend to one of those shows. I think it's a great, the best way to sort of introduce what we do to people is just come and see a, us do it live. Some of those casts are huge. Uh, I just got the scenario, the finished scenario from Scott Dorward that I'm going to be running uh, for Call of Cthulhu. It's just wild. I don't know how we're going to do it in under two hours, but uh, come on, come on and see us pop by the booth. The booth's going to be great. I got some pictures of the build the other day. Uh, it's <laughs> It's, just the, it's very accurate to what I drew in my little mock-up that I showed on the State of the Nation. It's, it's oddly reminiscent of that. A uh, couple seats left in the gauntlets. <laughs> Would we call that odd? I mean, it's what you ordered. <laughs> it is, but I was just like, I mean, I literally just had the idea, I drew it, and then that's what it ended up being. Uh, but uh, yeah, I can't wait to arrive Wednesday, go in there and see kind of what it is. I mean, I'll be sent pictures and stuff. I've got videos of the build happening, but there's nothing like going in. And I remember seeing our booth for the first time. And like, Holy shit. It, this, this looks like the mock-up. This is amazing. It's really happening. Uh, I can't, I can't wait. I just can't. I, San, that's, that's the other thing about like San Diego Comic-Con. I'm excited for it. I'm excited to have some sick Mexican food and some good uh, beer. Uh, you know, look at some action figures. Cause that's pretty much all the co Comic-Con is like, Oh cool. Action figures. I action can't figures. buy. Uh, it's in a behind a glass case. I'm like, all right, I've seen Comic-Con, uh, but I'm excited <laughs> to perform there. But I just, it's kind of getting in the way of my Gen Con excitement because it is, it's next to Christmas. It's like my favorite thing we do all year. So I can't wait. Yeah. I mean, talking to the people at Marvel, I mean, they're way worse off than we are, you know, because they happen, it happens to be San Diego Comic Con right before Gen Con, both of which are enormous for their company, specifically for the Marvel Multiverse role-playing game. So yeah. uh, our, our friends at Marvel are just pulling their hair out right now as they launch into this two weeks of insanity. But uh, we're excited to be one small part of it. Lots of fun stuff uh, coming from Marvel. All right, let's let's uh, let's move on to the Glass Cannon Podcast, Campaign 2, Episode 43, which uh, that's a fun one. We, we uh, you know... oh. Finish off this encounter with the skeletons, wake up inside of this, uh, or not wake up, but start the episode inside of this ca cavern, piecing through, you know, what's been left behind, uh, including finding a nice little magic uh, crossbow. Uh, one of the first magic items we've actually managed to find <laughs> in this campaign. Uh, and then that creates, obviously, a, a little, uh, little discussion about who's going to get that. Let me ask you this, just in general. As a GM, as a player, whatever. What do you? What's your general feeling? I like to check in on this every once in a while. What's your general feeling on the concept of the roll off for an item at, at the average table? Like rolling off for an item, two players want. Uh, what are your thoughts on that process? I think it's the fairest way of doing it. Uh, I, I think if a lot of people have seen uh, the the complaints about us in years past, is like it just seems antithetical to role play for it like someone this is going to be best for if there's multiple people that want it rolling off seems to be the most fair way it's funny some of these shows were recording for gen con like we did our starfinder uh session the other day and uh deathmatch island which i can't wait for people to see deathmatch island has a mechanic in it for like how uh the Loot stuff you find is, is distributed? distributed yeah and it it's not static um you know the way we did it in Starfinder, a little spoiler is like the captain decides we found something it was like well who gets this we're like well the captain should decide and we all were <laughs> yeah. kind of like yeah the captain decides uh which could lend to, you know lead to some problems if you've got like a, a captain that's just like well i want everything that could be a real problem <laughs> but uh it worked out for Starfinder. Be a bad captain bad captain 
Deathmatch Island has a real, I'm interested for people to see this, it has a really cool mechanic where it changes who decides based on, you know, sort of the results of each contest. And I was like, oh, that's a fun like way of a, doing like it. Like a possession arrow in basketball? <laughs> kind of, but like you go through these contests and uh, and contests can mean a, a bunch of different things. So I'm not really spoiling anything. And at the end of each contest, there is a clear winner and the winner decides how the loot is distributed. But the next okay. contest, there could be another winner and they decide. So you, they can be like, you know what? I'm going to take that and that and you guys get this. Um, and that's interesting. <laughs> I don't think <laughs> it would really cool. work for our group, nor... We don't really have a captain, you know, like in, in Giant Slayer, there were times when Baron was the leader. There were times when Lork felt like the leader. I think it would have felt weird if one of them just started distributing uh, stuff, you know. Yeah. I, I like the roll off, but, uh, you know, when you don't win the roll off, it sucks. Yeah, I think it's it. I don't like it at all. I think it's yeah. uh, an imperfect system. It's hard to say what's better, though. I, do, I, I feel like I guess a lot of the audience, the way you mentioned it before not a lot of the audience but the ones that had commented before i do agree it's like you should be able to role play out where this goes and how it goes because anything other than that to me is is immersion breaking in a way it, it kind of makes it weird i don't really get it and, i get that uh, i get now that. that's largely because i lose every roll off i've ever had <laughs> uh i'm sure that that's tainting uh my opinion on this a little bit however i do i just don't like it like as i get older and grumpier i'm, I'm getting like Nah, like if you can't make the decision, then that's that's a bad group. That's a bad party. You so know you think I mean? it should like, just be left to like, let's discuss this. I I, I think so. I, look, I mean, I'm talking about what I want. I'm not necessarily talking about yeah. what's practical. Uh, <laughs> I do think that there would be times when you'd have, you know, a good. I think a better example is this might, you know, not be. Uh, I, I don't know how this falls in the remaster, or whatever. But like the the idea of the something you would get all the time, like Ring of Protection plus one. Amulet of natural armor plus one, like uh, the kind of thing that helps anyone, right? And, and yeah, you could say the frontline fighters benefit a little bit more, but like um, cloak of resistance, everybody benefits from saving throws. So yeah. there's really no way to say it. I like the idea of the character of a character coming to a decision to let another character have it and that being part of their story. And then also like that character that got it knowing the next time something comes up you got to be a little bit more it's your turn yeah. it's your turn to give it to somebody else or to pass it off or whatever um i don't know to me that just feels more like the story keeping it in line with the story i just i don't like roll-offs i don't know why they're starting <laughs> to bother me they never used to i but uh something's irking me about it i'm like why well, can't we just figure out a way to do this you know like like adults yeah you maybe know? we rush to the roll-off uh, too often I think it's Capitacaza. Be like, oh, he, roll likes off? A, he loves a roll. -off. Loves a roll. -off. Dude, Loves you just did so his much. face exactly. That's what he always does. He's like, roll off, roll off. Uh, right? uh, it's like, well, can we talk about this? Because there might be something that like comes up. That's like, I, can, guys, can I have this? I really, really want it, and it's yeah, well within everyone's. This synergizes yeah. really well with this thing I have uh, that you didn't know about, or whatever. You know, it's like, okay, yeah, yeah, you take it. Though. Um, but it is. Eh, I know it's tricky. It's People tricky. want their magic items. It's hard to give them up. Yeah. Um, especially in a low loot campaign. Yeah. Uh, it's starving it's, for loot. It's Speaking of starving for loot, uh, we're starving for loot so much that, uh, the, the professor, uh, uh, Barnes who, you know, we're, you're really supposed to feel like is coming into this campaign being like a, a grounded and <laughs> very, uh, I don't know. What's the word I'm looking for? Even keeled and, you know, going to be less erratic than most of us. Uh, is, you know, charges into this, comes into this room in this cavern and just like pulls, you know, this magical shield off a wall, <laughs> triggering an encounter, and then just immediately goes to start killing these things that are like speaking some language, you know, back and forth. Yeah. Uh, I, I, you know, I was pretty surprised. I felt like it crossed over a little bit into, this is a weird area, right? Because it's very meta. There's like, there's one side of your meta brain is like, and this is me, I'm totally meta at the moment thinking like, they're speaking a language to each other. The GM is trying to feed to me that like, these are intelligent creatures that are not necessarily just there to hurt us, but have something else going on. And we just don't understand them. And they're just being defensive and we're being on the offense. But then there's the other meta, which is like, they're creatures in an encounter in a dungeon. 
they're there to attack you. Yeah. It's it's built and made for combat. This is a combat encounter. You know, just kind of let it be. So with those kind of things evening out, I defaulted to, well, what would Brother Ramius do? And Ramius hearing the conversation is kind of like, I think I'd like to not, you know, fight this. But it just cracked me up, the idea that, like, nobody had this conversation at all. They just went in and started <laughs> hacking these leshies to pieces the first chance they got. Uh, and so then, of course, I went a little bit overboard uh, describing Brother Ramius as, like, shock and disgust <laughs> at their murderous ways. Uh, tell me what's going through your head, uh, I guess, from the jump. Uh, this does seem in retrospect to just be a, a combat encounter and not really meant to be worked around or diplomatized. That's the, my, what my, my, what my takeaway impression was at the end. They just wanted to eat us apparently. So yeah. What well, would that's what I wanted you to feel, but it's a totally skippable encounter. It's yeah. meant, you, you can, it, it's kind of meant for you to diplomacy your way out of it. Oh, okay. now, the, the one change that I made is like, I didn't want them to speak common as written these, mo like a, a, uh, mushroom leshy or fungus leshy, whatever they were, they, they speak common, but I'm like, you telling me these mushrooms on Castrovel speak common? No, let's see if they have a way around this. And it made for a lot more interesting real uh, oh, that role is interesting. play. Um, and also might make you think uh, differently next time you uh, plan, uh, you know, prep spells. You're like, maybe I should toss in a little comprehend languages just yeah. in case. Um but yeah, it's totally skippable. I thought about not even engaging in combat to just like kind of move things along. I've been doing that a lot more with strange aeons. It's like, let's just, let's go here. But then I was like, no, I'm going to leave it to the players and see what, what happens here. And your instincts were, uh, I don't want to say correct, but they were kind of in line with, with what I thought you guys might do. Oh, wow. I, you yeah. know, what? that's the first time hearing that for you. I thought I was 180 off. No, I thought you just wanted a fight and you were like, oh my God, like kind of eye roll, like. Oh, Brian, can we not drag this out? Can we just kill these things and move on to the next encounter? Yeah, I almost didn't even prep the encounter. I was like, you know, I'm just going to kind of like get through this and we'll have a funny little leshy thing. But yeah. then I was like, you know what? No, let's let's follow their lead and see what they do. And just because of initiative, like if you had rolled a higher initiative, right. that would have gone totally differently, I think. Um, because it's you also wouldn't possible, have come out. I can't remember how high Barnes rolled. He rolled uh, higher, but like, was he highest? He was uh, highest because he drew first blood. Yeah, that's they, what really you surprised me. Complain, it's not really like, Matthew's style. Yeah, I was, I was surprised. But you know, people get bloodthirsty. They're like, I want yeah. this shield. They're going to not let me keep my new shield uh <laughs> yeah i was a little surprised but also like it goes back to this meta you just assume oh monsters kill let's we get a roll for initiative and kill and uh i don't know i'm really trying to lean into providing new solutions out of encounters and that happened recently in some other encounter what was it, it might have been for strange aeons i can't remember uh, it might have been Glass Cannon, where you guys came up with another solution around an encounter. I just think it varies a little bit more to not always have to fight things to the death. Yeah, I, I agree. And so uh, just sitting from my chair, like as a GM, I, I love it when players take an opportunity to work around combat. I think that it's really fun. There are times when it's like, you know, when you, you kind of want your players to read the room and you're like, no matter what you do, they're going to fight to the death. Like, yeah. let's just keep it moving. But I do appreciate the effort, and I like to reward that effort. We talked a few weeks ago about giving experience for bypassing combat encounters. You know, the same you would get if you killed them. I said that I often do that because I do really appreciate working around encounters in that method. But, you know, you're also motivated by – I'm also motivated slightly by this other meta detail, which is I happened to prepare a spell that was perfect for this, for this exact scenario. Like, I thought that there might be creatures down here that think we're invaders when we're trying to just get information and talk to this elf uh, woman at some point. And so I'm just like – Maybe I'll prepare this spell. And it was the perfect spell. It was amazing. And it then you perfect, rolled yeah. right into it, which really worked out well. And I was glad we didn't have to kill them. They're leshies. They're yeah. cute. People they love just wanted to eat something. And I right. mean, as, as written in the book, it was like they could you could bring any of the corpses from the other rooms to like bargain with them. Oh, wow. And so that's okay. what you guys did. That's um, what we ended up doing. Look at yeah, that. It was fun. And, you know, it kind of pushed things forward. I, I don't want to say too much because we've, we've recorded ahead, but uh, there's some fun stuff coming up. Yeah, it's fun stuff coming up. Uh, okay, with that, let's uh, let's move along. We'll talk more about the next episode next week as we uh, take a little time here for We Are Stupid. Uh, sing us in there, we Nicholas Lowe. We are stupid! 
Uh, this is something that I think we have a blind spot for. Uh, it comes up from time to time, and I'm confident in myself saying I always get this wrong. And now I think, courtesy of Professor Eric, I never will again. I think I think wow. it has been laid out in a way that Too makes bold sense. Stick. Yes. Um, the only note Professor Eric has on this combat is the concept of the burst. The burst versus the emanation. What makes a burst different from an emanation? Troy. Uh, I could not answer this before Professor Eric laid right. it out. I When I was prepping the Starfinder session that we ran last week, which will air during Gen Con, I... Uh, was looking this up and I'm this I'm 50 50 when I get this right because one is centered on the creature and right. one is centered on uh the intersection of one of the lines of its square right um so I'm gonna say emanation center of the creature burst intersection that is correct now you say center of the creature Why does it know the rules it's not it's not center of the creature as much as it well it usually emanations do come from a creature but it's center of center the, of the square. center of a square yeah right. absolutely so let's look at a quick visual aid here if you want to check it out on the youtubes you can do so uh, i'll zoom in here to make it a little easier this so is this the same lays one it out that nicely. I was this is what week. professor eric sent me uh, you've got the you've got the emanations uh, on one side and bursts on the other. And you can see they make a huge difference. Mm -hmm. So a 10 foot emanation, which is what like, uh, well, bless is 15 feet, right? But like an emanation is, bless is an emanation. So when it comes out from uh, Brother Ramius, it's going out to every square that would essentially be 10 feet away if Brother Ramius was to move 10 feet. You know, it's it's everything that would cover 10 feet of movement for Brother Ramius, whereas the burst comes on the intersection and essentially is just a box of four squares with two squares to the east, two squares to the north, two squares, I'm sorry, two squares to the west, two squares to the north, two squares to the east, two squares to the south. So almost like a little plus sign. Uh, and what you end up getting with that is uh, less area on a burst, more area on an emanation. Emanations, generally speaking, are, um, yeah, they're generated by creatures. A lot of times you think of them as buffs. Sometimes they're debuffs. Auras, I think, Auras, yeah. tend to be Auras emanations. bursts, most times, are spells you cast at things that have a target area, and then they burst. So we have to remember that, especially with something like a fireball, the, the target is a an intersection, not a square. And that does mean it actually will hit less area. Uh, than it would if we made a square and then everything that's 20 feet from that square um, just it makes it slightly smaller. So, and, you know, important distinction. And I appreciate that. I don't think I don't think I'm going to forget it anymore. Burst yeah. is the the intersection. Emanation is the creature itself. You know, and with Foundry, we've been really good about using the templates uh, to drop down, like just dropping those on makes it very clear. And this is something we could have done ages ago, uh, but it's just easier <laughs> in Foundry to drop that shit on there. And you see exactly like, sorry, you're in the blast. Is that where you want to put it? Um, and I think I've been pretty good about like, you sure you want to put it there? Because uh, Zephyr's going to be in there. Uh, no, let's move it over and you can play with it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, what I was going to say is like uh, one thing I – if you're a large creature, you get extra, right? Like because you burst – or the, the emanation is is larger, The emanation right? is larger if you're a large creature because you still get all of that that juice from the uh, – from, from your size. Basically, you start further away. You start further away, yeah. Yeah, so here we – you can see it here. Here's a large creature, 10-foot emanation. Uh, sorry, yeah, yeah, you can see my cursor there. Large creature versus medium creature. Yeah. So it's a whole set of of uh, squares that are affected that would not be if you were a medium creature. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. Very cool. Um, okay, with that, let's do a quick listener mail uh, as the Nash writes in. It's time for listener mail. We got a quick and a fun one today uh, from Nate. Bargazzi? In... I don't have a location. Nate. Oh, man. I don't have a location. Is he homeless? 
<laughs> Nate, a homeless so man sent us listener mail. <laughs> Nate from the streets <laughs> writes Nate in. Street. <laughs> Nate from the streets um, uh, writes in and says, "Hello, I work with endangered shorebirds called piping plovers. We name all of. Uh, hold on, I, I actually guys a got a good job. Can I get an apartment? <laughs> can I get an apartment? Uh, check this out. This uh, you, you know you know this bird." This is a piping plover. Oh, piping plover, sure. These little guys that run up by the shoreline, I think, and then they sk- they skitter skitter away as the surf comes in. Uh, piping plovers. Uh, Nate says we name all of our adult birds and all the young that make it to a certain age. Last summer, we named one of our adults Lork, and he <laughs> returned this year to successfully raise three chicks. <laughs> Since they made it to the age where they can survive on their own, it's time to get named. And I figured I would give Joe first naming rights. Pretty much anything is fair game, but Sir Will, Della, and Galabras are all already taken. Oh, my God. Best Nate. Uh, so I thought I'd throw it out to the two of us to, get, to give him three names uh, for the, the young of uh, Lork. But I'll throw one out there right away because I think it's a great bird name. Nico. Nico, okay. I'm going to throw Nico out there. It's I thought you were going to say just son. I'm like, that's going to doom that bird. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> Someone's no, going to cut that bird's head off. <laughs> I couldn't do such a thing. Nico's uh, good. Yeah. So uh, I think Nico is a good bird name. You got one? You got Well, anything? they have to be, the way I'm thinking of this is like sort of figuratively, they have to be your babies. Like if Lork birthed all your other characters, uh, you know, it, I'm thinking in that sense. So like ne- there is no Nico without Lork. That's the way I'm thinking of this. Yeah. So, okay. Okay. Keeping that in mind, I think you need, uh, what's your demon's name and uh, 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 Rise of the Rune Lords? Uh, a Verxius? A Verxius would be a good <laughs> piping plover. <laughs> that's amazing. A tiny little bird named a Verxius. <laughs> What's that bird? Oh, that's a Verxius. <laughs> <laughs> would be amazing if suddenly that bird asserted like a certain sense of dominance. Uh, just like, <laughs> oh man. Um, what about, this would not be birth, birth from Lork, but <laughs> what about Rasmataz? <laughs> You can't, you can't beat that for a bird name. You can't beat Rasmataz, right, for a bird name? Yeah, Rasmataz is fun. Uh, just make sure you spell it right. Yeah. Is, is it Rasmataz or is it Razamataz? Is there it's another Razzmatazz. A? Razmataz. Just Razmataz, not Reza. There's no A between the Zs and the M. No. Razmataz. And now that I'm saying, make sure you spell it right, I can't remember how to spell it. I know it ends in two Zs, but I don't know if there's two Zs in the middle or one. I'd have to look back at my notes. You, cause, so it's not based on the color? No. It was just based on random improv. Uh, <laughs> the color... Oh, no. The color has no A between the Zs and the Ms. It's Razmataz. I have it here. It's, it's Raz, R-A-Z-Z-M-A-T-A-Z-Z. And that is the how you spell the color. Yeah. It's, Razmataz. Two Zs and two Zs. That color... The, that color, Rasmataz, is what triggered the whole the whole crown discussion. Oh, somebody, is it? Sent, somebody sent me a picture oh, of a crown right. that said Rasmataz on the side, and it was it's like a pinkish, mauvish oh, God, color. That's such classic GCN pant. And uh, so, and what's yeah. that word you keep using? <laughs> Someone sent you, you a just physical say? crown? <laughs> no, no, that's a. What do you call them? God, that's so funny. <laughs> that's amazing, Nate. Thank you so much for naming uh, these endangered shorebirds after glass cannon. Uh, Iconic characters. Uh, let's Nico, go with Nico. Averxius and Rasmataz. Nico, Averxius and Rasmataz. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Uh, sounds good. Well, that's all the time we have for this week. A uh, short one this week as we head out to San Diego Comic-Con. We will we'll be back in a week. Fear not. Uh, yeah. we'll, we'll be back for... Um, Oh, sorry. I got to set something here. We'll be back uh, for Gen Con week, of course, as we get pumped for the biggest con of the year, our biggest Ooh. event of the year. Uh, we'll have lots to talk about then. So... Check out Glass Cannon Live tomorrow night. Check out Pen Dragon, part one of the actual story, Friday night. Uh, and then, man, you're one week away from a metric ton of content dropping every day of the week, all day, or every day of the weekend, all day. It's going to be great. Uh, until then, take it easy, everybody, and we'll see you next week. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.